renters just tend to tear up homes. They kind of create nuisance and noise for, for the neighbors and the community. So most people just would rather have their home sit empty. You know, reading books, surrounding yourself with mentors and other entrepreneurs who have, would be a great place to start. The thing that we're doing that's different and new and innovative is we're providing a, a service that makes this co-ownership model easy. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the podcast in partnership with Smartcast and Najahi Events. More about them later. Now, I've been trying to learn about successful unicorn startups that have been taking place around the world over a recent time. And I wanted to dig into one particular company today. That company is called Picasso. And I've got the CEO of Picasso joining us today, Austin Allison. Now, Austin's a tech entrepreneur. He's now the CEO of Picasso. As I said, he co-founded the company to make the dream of second home ownership a reality for more people after experiencing the profound effect it had on his own life. Austin started selling real estate at the age of 18 and worked in residential commercial real estate for a decade. Now, Picasso is Austin's second startup. In 2009, he founded Dotloop in his hometown of Cincinnati, a company that created software to seamlessly manage real estate transactions. Zillow acquired Dotloop in 2015, and Austin continued to run Dotloop as a Zillow executive till 2018. Picasso was inspired by the widespread desire to own second home by homeowners who can't afford it. Giving you some perspective right now, folks. This is a billion dollar business and it's not even two and a half years old. They raised nearly $200 million in funding from SoftBank and they are flying. And I really want to get to the bottom of what makes Austin tick, but also how we built this company so quickly, what it does, the difference it makes and the impact it can have on all of us for the good. Let's cue the music and get into this one. Organizations such as Smartcast, who are solving the problem of food security in the world, have supported this podcast because they believe in the mission that I'm on. When you understand the work that they do at trying to solve the problem with this massive population growth we've been having over the years and providing a way of bringing food safely to everybody, it really is something I admire. And lastly, thank you to Najahi Events who have been sponsoring us now on the podcast for over a year. Najahi bring motivational speakers to the region to help inspire, educate, and motivate you to achieve better success and live a better life. Well, Austin, thanks so much for coming to join us on the show today. Unicorn is a word that's kind of banded around a lot, but uh, not many people have achieved that. And that's something that I want to dive in with you today. But first of all, for the benefit of the audience, I want to really understand what this company Picasso is, because whenever I've said it, people think it's a painting until you spell it out to them. Once you spell it out to them, they're like, tell me more about it. And then they go to this website and they see this fractional home ownership model. And I'm staggered by the response I get just from people I know going to see it. So tell us a bit about Picasso, then we'll dig into you and your story afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first off, thanks for having me here, Spencer. It's a real pleasure. So Picasso, spelled P-A-C-A-S-O, is a service that helps people to co-own second homes together. So imagine your favorite, you know, second home dream destination. Uh, Picasso enables you to buy an eighth or a quarter of a home in that destination and we handle all the details associated with operating the home. So everything from bill pay to maintenance to design and furnishing so that you just get to enjoy the home that you own without any of the headaches that are customary of, of home ownership um, in the traditional sense. So that's the model in a nutshell. Uh, we're in about 40 destinations uh, throughout the, the US and Europe and expanding quickly. Wow. So let's just dig into that a little bit deeper. So let, let's take a, a, a typical second homeowner. So let's say, you know, my parents, they're, they're from the UK. Let's say they want a holiday home. I don't know, we'll take Spain. That's a good example. They want a holiday home in Spain. The reality is they're not going to spend a huge amount of time there because they've got careers and lives and everything else that go back home. Typically, they'd buy a holiday home. And I suppose their options would be to buy it, use it when they wanted to, and maybe Airbnb it when they're not there. 
but then take the risk of people damaging it? Would that be the, you know, the, the alternative to doing this? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, there are, we estimate that there's more than a hundred million second or holiday homes around the world. And most of those holiday homes are sitting vacant for 80 to 90% of the time, because you're right that most people only use their holiday home one to two months per year. And it really just doesn't make a lot of sense to buy 100% of something that you're only going to use 10% of the time. But there's never been a way in the past to right size your ownership. So it leaves people with two options. You either buy the whole thing and have it sit empty for most of the year, or you buy the whole thing and rent it out for part of the year. And while renting it out can be a good option for some people, it's a lot of work. You know, you're, you're a landlord, right? You're, you're dealing with, with the issues that come with being a landlord. You're getting calls at two in the morning. Renters tend to treat things like renters as opposed to owners. So they tend to damage the home more frequently and they're transient. So they're, they're renting your home for a weekend or a week or, you know, a couple of weeks. They're not coming back year after year after year with skin in the game. So it's a very, very different type of model. The way that I like to describe where Picasso fits is on a spectrum of usage. Like imagine if we were sitting in front of a whiteboard right now and I drew a line across the whiteboard and on one end of the whiteboard, you have frequent usage, which would be six months, a year or more. And then on the other end of the whiteboard, you have very infrequent or transient usage, like once a year or less. If you're going to use a home only once a year or less, you should just rent the home or rent a hotel. If you're going to use a home six months, a year or more, you should just buy the whole home. Picasso and co-ownership really fits in the middle. It's for people who are going to use the home more than once a year, but less than six months a year. And there's never been really a good solution for that in the past. Hmm. I suppose that there was, there was timeshare, wasn't there? That was something that was available to people in different parts of the world where they would get, I don't know, one or two weeks a year if they paid an amount of money. How, how, is, how is it different to timeshare? Yeah, so with, with timeshares, you're sharing time. With Picasso, you're sharing ownership. This is real ownership. Like it's, it's our model is no different than three or four friends or family members buying a home together. You know, you, you own 100% of the property with your other co-owners. With a timeshare, you're really prepaying for the right to use time. It's, you're, not really, you're not really buying real estate, right, that you own. Um, timeshares also tend to be uh, resort and, and hotel products with lots and lots of, of people who participate in the program. Like as an example, if you were to take a typical hotel with 300 rooms and convert it to a timeshare project, timeshares are sold in increments of 52 because they're sold in weeks. So you have 52 units per room. That's 15,000 units in a single property, right? With a 300 room hotel. With Picasso, these are just single family homes. Every home is unique. There's a maximum of eight owners per home. Usually we'll see like five or six owners because some people will buy a quarter uh, or three eighths of the home. So it's a unique product with limited supply and a very small amount of owners in true ownership, as opposed to more of a rental vacation product that you get with the timeshare. Okay, understood. So then comes the next question. If there's eight people that own it, my wife, my wife was the first person to jump on this. She was like, yeah, but what if we want Christmas every year? And that, that, in that moment, I was like, yeah, what if we do want Christmas every year? If there's eight owners, how, how do you manage it effectively so that everyone can get what they want when they want in a way that's, uh, I suppose, respectful, but also, you know, effective so everyone really does benefit from the true experience? So... Uh, your wife was very astute in, in her question because that is the top question that we get when, when people call in is how does the scheduling work? And you know, if you want Christmas every year, there's a way to do it. You just have to pay eight times the price to buy the whole home. Um, <laughs> with, with Picasso though, what, what we get you is we get you most of the dates that you want every year. You're not going to get 100% of the dates that you want because you don't own 100% of the home. But you are going to, most of our owners describe it as getting 80 to 90% of the dates that they want. You're going to get most of what you want out of the home. So there's a little bit of compromise on scheduling, but the compromise is well worth it because of the savings. You're getting 80% of what you want for 85% less upfront and on an ongoing basis. So the value exchange is just a no brainer for most people. 
And if you really want to get, you know, most or pretty much all of the dates that you want, you just buy a quarter as opposed to an eighth. And that's something that we see a lot of our owners do because it gives you sort of twice the, the, the buying power, if you will, in the scheduling algorithm. But the way that we manage scheduling is we've created a proprietary scheduling tool. We call it Smart Stay. And Smart Stay is, and it's available via an app. So if you become a Picasso owner, you get access to an app. And within the app, you get this calendar feature called Smart Stay. Smart Stay is effectively a shared calendar, except for on the back end of the calendar, there's a series of rules and algorithms that distribute the calendar fairly and equitably amongst the ownership group. So if you own one fourth of the home, Smart Stay will ensure that you get one fourth of the holidays, one fourth of the peak season, and one fourth of the non peak season. And it distributes the calendar very dynamically and very equitably amongst the group. So no one person is able to get their their unfair share of the of the dates. The other thing to note, though, that's pretty neat about this model is that um, it turns out that not everyone travels at the same time every year. That's actually a bit of a misconception. And the reason why many people think that or assume that is because we often travel with people who have similar interests um, or, or kids that are the same age um, or, or whatever the case might be, meaning let, let, let's say that you travel with four other families that all have kids who are in ski school and you go to the mountain the same seven or eight weekends every year. Like the co-ownership model doesn't work very well if you put all those people in the same home because everybody would be competing for the same dates all the time. But with Picasso's model, the ownership group is very diverse. You get some people that like the winter, some people that like the summer, some people that like Christmas, some people that like you know, New Year's or, or, or whatever. And the more diverse the ownership group, the less schedule conflict you have right out of the gate. So it's actually rare to see more than two or three owners competing for, for a date, you know, a particular holiday. And generally the way that that works is you'll rotate year after year. So if you really want Christmas, you're probably going to get Christmas every other year or every third year, worst case scenario, but you're definitely going to get some Christmas time and you're always going to get holiday time. You know, that's a really good point because I said to my wife, she said, well, look, we, we like to go skiing. I said, yeah, but you've got no idea how, how many people love to be in the mountains in the summer. You know, we just came back from the Italian yeah. Dolomites just two weeks ago. My wife had never been to the mountains in the summer. And she's like, this is spectacular. I'm like, yeah, get it. You know, why would I not want to spend, if I had a Picasso property, four weeks in the summer or three weeks in the summer, right. going hiking and mountain biking and doing that? I wouldn't need to be in a ski resort for three months over the course of that right. period. So it, yep. yeah, 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 absolutely makes sense. I just make sure I don't tell the algorithm that I really like the summers in the mountains because it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's interesting that you say that because I mean, eventually this sort of happens naturally, this, this distribution and, and diversification that happens amongst the ownership group comes pretty naturally today. But in the future, we, we, we will start to sort of optimize for this. And if you're a summer person, and you're looking at a home in the Dolomites, our algorithm will be able to tell you which homes are a better fit for you based on your travel preferences, right? Because mm. you'd, you'd rather be in a home that has more winter people, right? Who aren't going to be competing for the, the summer dates. And I'm the same way. My second home is in a mountain called Lake Tahoe, which, you know, some people go to Lake Tahoe for the skiing, but I go for the summer. I could care less if I ever go in the winter, right? So you really want a, uh, a mix of people who prefer different seasons and, and different um, sort of dates. There's also, there's also a lot of people who prefer, and I'm one of these people, who prefer shoulder seasons over peak seasons because the peak seasons are busy. You know, it's hard to get reservations at restaurants. There's a lot of traffic. There's long lines at the, at the resorts and amenities. And the shoulder season's kind of nice. It's where you really feel like a local you know, when you go in the shoulder season. And um, so a lot of people actually prefer that. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, as a model, it sounds great. It, do, do the behaviors of different people from different parts of the world see this model differently? So do people from the US, is it kind of like, this is bread and butter, we understand this kind of stuff. And over in Europe, people are scratching their heads trying to work out whether it makes sense. Have you found that? We have not found that. I mean, right, right now we're just in the US, Mexico, uh, Europe, and the UK. And across those destinations, we've, we've not really found a lot of differences in the way that people think about second homes. There are some tactical 
differences around the way that the business works and the way that the transaction works. Like the, the tax laws are different. The way the transactions get done are a little different. But in terms of people's, you know, interest and aspiration in owning a holiday home, that's pretty consistent across all of our destinations. The pain point associated with the traditional model of which is underutilization, right? Like whether you live in, in the UK or the US or Dubai, you know, there most people would prefer to not be wasteful. Most people don't like the idea of buying 100% of something that is going to sit vacant and be wasted 90% of the time. So the concept really resonates uh, in a pretty profound way across all the markets that we're in. In fact, you know, I've been a part of a couple of, of different startups uh, that have had some success over the years, and I've not seen a single business that has product market fit, like what we found at Picasso. Like the, the pent up demand for people who aspire to own a, a holiday home or a second home um, and the consistency of the pain point around cost and hassle is just like undeniable and uniform ac across all these different regions. Mm. So that's what we've experienced to date. Okay, let's take a couple of examples here. I'll, I'll, I'll be an example. So I had property in London, I had property in Dubai, but I had property in London, Cyprus, Portugal, and Florida. Those properties I had when I wasn't using them, which considering there's a bunch of them, I didn't use them that often. It wasn't the property sitting empty. It was the hassle factor and the anxiety of owning those properties and worrying what might what happen to them. So we had we had a problem with security at the property in Portugal and I had to go over there and deal with it. So that was a flight. That was a couple of days out of my life and it was just a headache and a hassle. And in the end, I was just like, I, yeah. I don't want it. Get rid of it. And then even though my, my parents retired to Cyprus, the property I owned was on the other side of Cyprus. That just become a ball ache and a pain in the bum to deal with. It's not just just having it. It's dealing with, you know, the, the, the letting agency not being very good and, you know, don't know whether the plumber's done his job or right. not, all that kind of stuff. So I had to get rid of that. The property in the UK that I had, but my kids were in the UK. And when they were younger, I was in, in London every other weekend. So that's fine. I had, I had, I had a property there. As they got older, I was there every third weekend. And then they got into their mid-teens. I was there every fourth weekend because they were too busy to see their dad. So I literally was spending four days a month in my house. And the rest of the month, the house sat completely empty. Still had to pay for the cleaners. Still had to pay for everything else. So that was a great reason for me to kind of like, in my mind, just offload these properties because they become a hassle. This is where Picasso fits. Another example, a friend of mine owns a... 5 million euro property in Cyprus. I was talking to him the other day. I said, when was the last time you went to your property? He's got his house and he's got a house for each of his daughters either side. I said, when was the last time you went? And he just looked at me, he went, before COVID? <laughs> and I'm like, what, that's just set empty? He's like, yeah, I know, I really need to go yeah. and see it. I'm like, what are you doing? So would somebody yeah. in that position, let's say somebody owned, like he owns a luxury property, which I see listed on your website, very beautiful properties. If he came to you and said, Look, I've got this property, I hardly ever use it. I'll keep one eighth of it. Do you want to sell seven eighths of it for me and run it? Is that something somebody could do? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we do that all the time. In fact, the first property we ever did, which was in Napa Valley, California, uh, where I'm at right now, was one of those properties. So it's, it's a very common use case. Because what we found with second homeowners is that most of them really don't want renters in their home. You know, most of them choose to not do the rental thing because renters just tend to tear up homes. They, you know, they kind of create nuisance and noise for, for the neighbors and the community. So most people just would, would rather have their home sit empty as opposed to dealing with that. But this is a, a new and interesting model that enables people to sort of right size their ownership and take some equity off the table while retaining a portion of the home that they would have used, you know, that's all they would have used in the first place anyway. So yeah, it's a really great model. The only caveat is it's gotta be a home in a, in a market where we operate and it's gotta be a home that we think other people would be interested in. But as long as it meets those two criteria, yeah, absolutely, that's, that's very interesting. So then the other thing that I thought was really interesting about the model is that there are many people that would like a holiday home. But maybe they've got half a million dollars as a budget, which means they might get a one or two bed somewhere on the seafront, and that's pretty much what their budget would extend to. By going down this route, they're gonna move from a one or a two bed to essentially a $4 million home, 
with the same budget and they're going to get the benefit of, I don't know, a five bedroom villa that's luxuriously furnished and all that kind of stuff. And so you're literally going from a mindset of, yes, I can live somewhere, you know, two bedroom apartment on the sea. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. To now a palace and I haven't got to spend any more money. That's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, that is a huge, huge unlock for all of our buyers. I mean, I, I know you checked out some of our properties in Marbella. So we'll use that example. Mar in Marbella, half a million euro buys you a small apartment, probably without water views, right? Maybe a, it's maybe a, a palm tree. You know, that, <laughs> yeah, if, if you're lucky, right? <laughs> so you're, you're not getting much at that price point in that market, but 500,000 euro with Picasso buys you a $4 million compound, right? With just incredible views, uh, you know, lots of caught 700, 800 square meters of space, like, you know, beautiful, beautiful properties. And that's just a massive, massive unlock. And so when you think about the spectrum of buyers that we're serving, it's actually, it's really vast. It ranges from people who maybe, you know, couldn't have afforded a whole second home or, or couldn't have afforded the whole second home that they, they want. And this model is really an unlock because it makes second home ownership more accessible all the way to people at the other end of the spectrum in, in terms of net worth and income, you know, people who maybe have multiple second homes or, or holiday homes today, but just can't justify the hassle, as you mentioned, or can't justify, you know, the waste. They don't feel good about just being wasteful and, and, and all the things that come with that. So it, it really applies to a broad audience of people across a lot of different geographies. Okay. To raise the kind of money you raise must have been a journey. You've obviously been an entrepreneur before yeah. you've been involved in startups. Just take us through your background and how you got into the markets you got into, how you got into real estate technology as well. And uh, what happened from, you know, from start of your career. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I I'd love to just start with, with the very beginning. So you have some context around kind of who I am and, and how I landed here. Um, my dad was a carpenter. I grew up in a rural part of the United States called Ohio State. And my dad was a carpenter. So I grew up around real estate. We lived paycheck to paycheck. And I, I mentioned that because we definitely never had a, a holiday home or a second home. For me, you know, a vacation meant going to a local lake and staying at a tent nearby. So uh, having a second home was, was just a dream, you know, that, that I had early on because it was something that we didn't really, really didn't grow up with. And when I turned 18, I started selling real estate as a way to pay myself, pay my way through college. And I sold real estate for uh, all through undergrad. And then I ended up going to law school after undergrad. And while selling real estate, I found myself driving all over town chasing home buyers and sellers to get signatures on contract documents. And that inspired the idea for my first company, which is called Dotloop. And Dotloop digitized real estate transactions. We made it possible for people to buy real estate electronically. And this was 10 years ago now, or no, maybe almost 15 years ago now. So this was at a time where, you know, people weren't electronically signing contracts, like deals were still getting done with paper and fax machines. So we were one of the, the pioneers in the, the US around electronic transactions. And we became one of the most adopted softwares in the real estate uh, industry in the US. We had about a million real estate agents that used the software and about half of all transactions in the US flowed through this software. And then we sold to a company called Zillow, which is the leading real estate website in the US in 2015. And I stayed on there for about four years before starting Picasso. But the real unlock for this business, for, for Picasso and the idea really started about nine years ago for me, when my wife and I became second homeowners in Lake Tahoe, the town that I, I just mentioned. And, you know, it was, it was a dream come true. We bought the second home. We, we had saved up enough money to, to put the down payment on the second home, but we put everything on the line. You know, it, it, this was before we had sold the Zillow, so I still didn't have a lot of liquidity. It, it was it was a huge risk to buy the second home, but it just totally enriched our lives. It turns out when you buy a, a home, primary or secondary, you're not just buying a, a piece of property. You're buying a second community, a second group of friends, a second life, and that second home becomes your happy place. So for the last eight or nine years, I've been thinking about what if we could find a way to make this second home dream possible for more people? Because I knew 
that I wasn't alone in the dream to own a holiday home. And when we survey our audience, about 75% of families that we survey aspire to own a second home or a holiday home, which is a big mm. deal. Like this is the majority of the population above a certain income threshold aspire to own a holiday home, but most are unable to because of the cost and the underutilization. So that's really where the idea surfaced. And uh, again, been thinking about it for the last nine years. And three years ago, when I left Zillow to start my next company, I actually lived in, in Europe for a few months during, during that period. I, I took some time off and spent that time really understanding the problem that we were trying to solve at Picasso. And we started the company in early 2020 and have been really off to the races ever since. So how does, to, for the people out there that, you know, would like to learn more about starting a company, the challenges you face, the steps that you take and the steps and the mistakes that you make as well, what kind of, what kind of challenges have you faced? Obviously with Dotloop, you had the experience of doing a startup. How, did you raise funding with Dotloop? Yeah, I did. We raised uh, a total of $14 million with Dotloop and the experience was very different with Dotloop when compared to Picasso, given that it was the first time. So for first time entrepreneurs, I would say, you know, reading books, surrounding yourself with mentors and other entrepreneurs who have, you know, done companies or raised money in the past would be a great place to start. But a lot of it, you know, you, you just have to experience firsthand. I mean, a lot of a lot of these lessons uh, along the way just kind of come with time. I think that's that's part of what makes being a second or third time entrepreneur pretty interesting is you've seen a lot of the patterns, you've learned a lot of the lessons, and it enables you to to avoid some of the same mistakes, right? The second or third time around. But early on, the way that it worked for me at Dotloop, I knew nothing about fundraising. You know, I started reading a book on on how to write a business plan. I was working for a real estate company at the time, and I I went into the office and sat across the table from my boss. His name was Jerry, and I told Jerry that I had been working on this this side project and that I thought I needed to go raise money in order for it to to survive. And I asked him if I could take a leave of absence from work to go raise money and find a CEO for this business. Cause I was really loyal to Jerry and the company that I was working for. So my vision at the time was to find another entrepreneur to go run this business that I had was working on. Jerry goes, why don't you come around the, the desk here and show me the software? So I, I go around the desk, I show Jerry the software on his screen. And you know, after I show him the software, he, he tells me to walk around to the other side and he's kind of smiling. And he goes, Austin, you know, I have, I have one comment and one question for you. First, the comment is you have to go pursue this business. You can't go find another CEO to do this. I appreciate that you're so loyal to me and our company, but like I feel the passion when you describe this idea. And this may be kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity for you. You have to go follow this dream and we'll always be here. If you change your mind and want to come back and work with us again, we'll always be here for you but you have to go follow your dream. That's comment number one. Question was, would you allow me to be your first investor? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I, absolutely. And the first thing I thought is I said, and again, I knew nothing about fundraising, right? I didn't know what to do next. But the first instinct of mine was, by the way, do you know anybody else who might want to invest? And he goes, yeah, actually I do. You know, I'll, I'll set up a meeting with a couple of guys and Jerry and these, these other investors had never invested in a tech, like a startup before. It was also the first time Jerry had ever taken a flyer on, on, on an idea. But Jerry set up a meeting with three or four of his other friends. Uh, I think it was three of his other friends. And you know, I went and I pitched and they all wrote checks. And that was the first $500,000 that we raised of angel capital. So I ended up raising the first four or five million um, just like that, you know, $100,000 at a time uh, from high net worth individuals who just believed in me and, and the team we had assembled for this idea. And then eventually we got, I would say we were three or four years in and we had a real business. We were doing maybe $4 million in revenue a year. We were profitable. And at that point in time, we went out and did our Series A. And I flew out to San Francisco and started doing the tours on Sand Hill Road, which is the famous, you know, Silicon Valley Road, where a lot of these VCs are based. 
And we ended up raising uh, money from a firm called Trinity Ventures. And that was a $9 million investment that rounded out our 14. With Picasa, we've raised 230 million in a much shorter period of time um, at much higher values. Uh, so it's been a very different experience. This, the second Are the time principles around. the same though? Yeah, I, I would say the principles are definitely the same, but the difference, like when, when an investor is investing in a seed stage idea, meaning where it's, where it's just an idea, there's no proof that it's actually working or that it's a viable business yet. At that moment in time, the investor is really just investing in the team. There's not really a business for them to invest in. They're making a bet on the entrepreneur uh, or entrepreneurs, plural, plural uh, with multiple co-founders. And so the second time around, once you have a track record, you know, that you've created a value for investors in the past, the probability of your future success is higher. So it, it becomes easier for you, for you to raise money the second time around. But the, the, the principles are the same. Like it's all about the people, number one. Uh, number two, I would say it's important that you have an idea that solves a big problem for a large audience of people because value creation and market cap tends to follow value creation for customers. Like if you solve a lot of, if you solve big problems and deliver a lot of value for customers, there's a pretty big chance that you can create a big business. Like my first company, we ended up, you know, having about half of the market share in the United States, which is a massive amount of market share, but it was only a $120 million exit. So, you know, pretty small exit relative to the market share that we had created. And the reason why it was a small exit is because, uh, and I realized that 120 is still, you know, big, but relative to the market share that we got, 120 million was small. And the reason why is because the market size for productivity software is just not that big. I mean, there's probably only, you know, 100 million or 200 million of, you know, dollars that are spent in a given year by real estate brokerages on agent productivity software. So we just weren't operating in a big market. Whereas with Picasso, the market's huge. It's in the trillions. Like, you know, if, if we just get 1% of second homes in the U.S. and Europe, we've created a giant, you know, uh, business uh, with with just a fraction of a percent of the market share. So that was a lesson that I learned in the first one around total addressable market and, and how that influences the opportunity of the business that you're creating. Ultimately, the most important thing, particularly early on, is it's all about the people. You know, surround yourself with great people from your investors to your mentors to your co-founders and employees and good things tend to follow great people. SoftBank seemed to get a bit of a bum rap when it comes to investing, particularly the recent news that came out. That When you take on that kind of money from one source, you, you've got to be clear that the relationship works, I'm assuming. I've never raised that much money, so I've not, not even been into that space. But was it, was it a very easy decision to work with them or was it something that you questioned? It was a very easy decision. In fact, SoftBank was one of the, the top yeah, they were like at the top of our list of firms that that we wanted to have involved because and you know they have gotten you know a lot of negative press recently but i mean one of the one of the things that you have to give them a lot of credit for is uh, they've been a catalyst for many large category creating companies and it's it's easy to overlook those successes you know when when the media is focusing on uh the negatives but um they've definitely been a part of a lot of category creators and we're trying to create a big category here. And I, I think um, SoftBank had, had a lot to add uh, to us through that process. So they were, they were high on our list. To be clear, we, we've got a lot of investors. SoftBank's just one of them. I mean, SoftBank's less than a third of, of the capital that's gone into the business. So we've raised about 230 million of equity uh, over the course of three rounds and SoftBank participated in our, our last round, which was our series C about a year ago. And we've also secured more than a billion dollars in debt from a variety of, of banking partners. And that enables us to facilitate the, the onboarding of these homes into, into the Picasso platform. But I mean, with all of our invest, investors, it's again, it all goes back to people. Like what you're really more than the firm what you're what you're really picking is the the partner at the firm that you're working with. So at SoftBank, we work with a woman named Lydia Jett, 
She's fantastic. She's super smart, super passionate, really connected with our, our mission very early on. And, and it was really, you know, Lydia that we chose. She just happened to work at SoftBank. Now, when you think about that kind of money in that shorter period of time, when you started the journey, did you, did you think beyond your wildest dreams that you'd be able to raise that amount of money that quickly for this business? Or did you think, hold your horses, man, here, wasn't expecting that. Tell me the truth. I did not expect in my wildest dreams that we would have gotten to where we are in this period of, in this short of a period of time. Like I, I absolutely had complete conviction that Picasso would be a large category creating, you know, business that enriched the lives of millions of people someday. But usually these things take a lot yeah. of time. You know, I mean, most businesses, if, if you're lucky enough, uh, most businesses never find really strong product market fit, right? Like it's hard to, to start a yes. business from scratch, but for the businesses who are lucky enough to, to find it in a meaningful way, it takes years, like five, six, seven years in many cases. And we were really fortunate to find product market fit in five to six months. And I think there was certainly a lot of, you know, preparation, but I don't believe in overnight successes. Like the 15 years leading up to the start of Picasso was preparation for this moment from, you know, the experience that uh, my co-founder and I had, had gained over the years to the network of people uh, that we had connected with. Like we were able to start Picasso right out of the gate with a, like a world-class team of people, of investors, uh, with a lot of knowledge about the industry and a very clear understanding of the problem. So all of those things definitely led to, you know, a great start, but I would say we also got, you know, lucky in, in, in the way that the stars aligned as it relates to timing. Like it, I think it was the right idea at the, the right moment in time with the right team of people who had assembled around the idea and the stars just aligned in such a way that we were able to, you know, have escape velocity right out of the gate. We did 300 million of revenue in our first year. And, you know, we're still growing like mad, you know, even amidst, you know, pretty, pretty challenging macroeconomic times, the business is growing super fast and uh, we're, we're very fortunate for that. So you got to be a little, a lot of hard work and a little bit of luck and you got to always be very, or I find that it's helpful to, to be very grateful and humble and kind of never take it for granted because um, it's hard work and things could change quickly, but you stay focused on the customer and the mission and continue to surround the company with great people. Like that tends to be a good formula that, that leads to, you know, progress and good results over yeah, time. Is your dad still with you? Uh, my dad, be, yeah. He must be very proud Absolutely. of you. Absolutely. He is very proud. He doesn't, I don't know that he understands my world. <laughs> you know, he's a carpenter. So he, uh, anytime I talk to him about my life and my crazy travels and all this stuff, you know, I think his head spins a little bit because he's a simple man, but uh, he is very proud. And I learned a ton, you know, about just some of my kind of basic entrepreneurial instincts and core values, you know, all that came from my dad who was, had his own carpentry business. And yeah, so very fortunate to have him in my life. It'd be great to sit and talk to him one day and say to him, what was it like having this boy? Hey, what happened? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just nice i think about that you know my, my i have daughters i've got my parents and whatnot that thankfully they're still alive and i always i always always wonder if they they recognize that kind of stuff and you know i don't think my parents really understand the world that i live in but they're always super pleased for me no matter what you know and it's just uh you know right but also don't get me wrong okay <laughs> they'll bring me down a peg or two if i get too big for my boots anytime anytime i'm around them so <laughs> there's that good too. i'm just spencer when i'm with them okay I want to just talk about the mechanics of the business from from a business point of view. Does a company like Picasso have to get regulated anywhere? Is that is that something you have to do? To be determined. We we certainly work very proactively with with all the communities where we operate, and we, we we're always exploring you know ways to collaborate with communities better, and and sometimes that that may involve you know regulation and kind of clarifying the, the rules of engagement for how owners occupy their homes and stuff like that. You know, as a general rule, like ownership is, is pretty common and, you know, people have a right to own property. People have a right to choose who they own property with and co-ownership is also very common. And most of the markets where we operate, 
it's not uncommon to see 20% or more of the homes in the market owned in the same structure, which is, you know, an, an LLC or other form of, of limited liability company, depending on the country that's owned by multiple people. So it's, it's common for people, whether it's family members who own property together, friends who own property together, obviously marital partners own property together, life partners own property together. So it's very, very common for people to own property together and has been for a long time. Picasso didn't invent that. And we're just operating within that same framework. Um, the thing that we're doing that's different and new and innovative is we're providing a, a service or I guess a set of services, you could argue, that makes this co-ownership model easy and intuitive. Because if you if you own property with other people today in the do-it-yourself format, you got to do all the work. Like you got to figure out how to share the calendar. You got to manage the property. You got to design the property. You got to pay the bills. And that's a lot of headache and hassle, uh, whether you're by yourself or with a lot of people. So our service is just taking care of all that stuff so that the co-ownership model is, is more intuitive. But I mean, the most important thing that we think about in the context of communities is uh, about being part of the solution. Like many... Many communities, second home communities in particular, where, where we tend to operate, you know, have, have challenges around housing that they're trying to navigate. In a lot of communities, there's housing affordability challenges where the local workforce has been priced out of, of homes and people who, who work in the bars and, you know, coffee shops and all that, you know, can no longer afford to, to buy homes or live in their own town. And the main, one of the main things that's driving that affordability problem in many of these destinations is second home buyers who are coming in buying up all the inventory. So one of the cool things about our model is like, let's take Marbella as an example. You know, if it weren't for Picasso's co-ownership model, you would have up to eight people buying up $500,000 apartments, which are in need by the local workforce. But thanks to Picasso's co-ownership model, those eight people are consolidating and buying one luxury home, right? Which, which isn't the inventory that the local workforce would have been buying anyway. So it has the benefit of actually consolidating demand away from the median tier to the luxury tier, which is good for housing affordability. The other big benefit of co-ownership is that the homes are utilized more. You know, these homes are utilized about 90% of the time on average, as opposed to 10 to 15% of the time for a normal second homeowner this this was a problem in the uk down in some of the cornwall and devon fishing villages where second homes were bought it, 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 we had the problem yep. of people not being able to live but the bigger problem was businesses were failing because there's no there's no footfall and if there's no footfall because you know all of these right. people 50 percent of the village is owned by people with second homes that aren't there for six months of the year then right. where, 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 how am I going to run my candy store? How am I going to run my ice cream van? How am I going to, you know, I've got my Costa Coffee franchise here. What's exactly. going on? Yeah, I get it. Just explain to me how you make money. So we make money by charging for our services. The first service that we provide is uh, organizing the co-owners and, and setting up this whole framework. Everything from finding the home to furnishing the home to designing the home to setting up the legal framework uh, aggregating the co-owners, all that stuff, we, we charge a service fee for, and the service fee is 12%. So if you look at a, sh and it's baked into the, sh the share price, by the way. So if you go to our website and you see a home in Marbella for half a million euro, um, a portion of that is our service fee, 12%. The other thing that we do is we provide financing for people who are interested in it. Uh, so we make a little bit of money on financing, not much, but a little bit. And I'd say like three quarters of the people who buy Picassos are using financing and about 25% are, are paying cash. Um, and then lastly, we, we make money on resale. So when you go to trade, we're, we simply charge a commission, same thing that you would pay if, if you were selling a whole home and we help to, to find the new buyer for you. Okay. And so how, how long do I have to own the property for? There is no limit on how long. Okay. So I can own it for, if in three years time, I'm like, I'm done with this. I'm never going back to Marbella. I want to buy a property in Denver. I can, I, you guys can help then offload my one eighth share if I've got exactly. one. Exactly. Does that work? Yeah, we charge you 6%, just standard real estate commission for that. 
and it's super seamless. I mean, so far, all the, the units that have retraded, resold, have sold in about 10 to 15 days for 10 to 15% more than what the owners paid about a year prior. So it's, it's, a, it's a very seamless transaction. Okay. And talk to me about how this is sold. Is this sold all through your website or do you work with, because I've seen some videos, you work with real estate brokers as well that sell on your behalf. Is that we correct? Do. Give me an idea of the split. What, what, what's, what, what's generated online and what's generated as a split through the brokers? Yeah, I would say, um, well, I, I, I don't know what the specific splits are actually, but I would say that our goal would be to have, you know, as many transactions as possible involving real estate agents. Like we have thousands of real estate agent partners all over the world. And we really think that there's a, an exciting partnership to be had with real estate agents because Picasso is a pretty interesting tool that real estate agents can use in their toolkit to add value to their clients. Because many real estate agents have a pipeline of buyers who don't have the budget to afford the home that they want. Right. If you're an agent in Marbella and you've got a half a million euro buyer that wants a three million euro home without Picasso, mm -hmm. there's there's no way to help them. Right. So this is <laughs> not, it's not this, happening. <laughs> exactly. So this is a tool that enables real estate agents to convert more of their pipeline and win more business. So it's good for them. But it's also good for us because they're effectively an extension of our sales team. So we just pay, you know, full real estate commissions to any agent who, who brings a buyer our way. You know, I don't know what the, the percentage breakdowns are though. So tell me when you first brought this subject up with the real estate brokers, we know what kind of people they are. I mean, for goodness sake, we, we're all exposed to lots of them. Was there much cynicism? <laughs> no, I mean, they, they actually loved it. I mean, they're, they're initially, I would say like anything that's new, it requires some explanation, you know, like, like on the surface, one, like one thing that a real estate agent could say as um, like an objection is, wouldn't I want to sell a whole home to my buyer instead of an eight yep. or a quarter of a home, right? Cause I get paid more on a whole home. Yeah. But the answer is like, if you've got a buyer that's in the market for a million, a million Euro or half a million Euro, like, they're not going to be buying a three or 4 million euro home anyway. So it's not, it's not like it's sort of taking down the amount of money that they're spending. It's just simply empowering your client to buy more home than they would otherwise be able to afford. The other thing that we're seeing is even for people who maybe have a budget for the three or 4 million euro luxury home, many of them will buy multiple Picasso shares in different homes. Like instead of buying one 4 million euro home, you could buy four quarters for the price of one. So you could kind of have four homes for the price of one. And we make the process so easy for real estate agents that it kind of feels like a referral. Like you just kind of bring your client, we do all the work, we answer all the questions and you make your full commission in exchange. So it's, it's really just about education. Like if, if you're an agent and you're not familiar with the model and it, it's easy to have a lot of questions around how it works and it can feel complicated on the service. But our goal is to make it as easy as possible so that you can add value to your clients. But again, without extra work or headache, because we know many real estate agents, particularly, you know, the best ones stay busy and we don't want to add any complexity or hassle to their lives. We want to eliminate it. Okay. Just as we start to finish up here, because I don't want to take too much more of your time. Your business is valued at what right now? Uh, last time, the last fundraise that we did was about a year ago, and that was a 1.5 billion valuation. And how old is the company? We started in 2020. We officially launched on October 1st of 2020. So almost two years old following our launch. So almost two years old and a valuation. It must sound nuts just bloody saying I, it. It, it is crazy, yeah. It's got to, hasn't it? I mean, let's it get real crazy. here for a second. You've got 1.5 billion, uh, billion valuation. You've raised $230 million. You've, you've been in business a couple of years effectively. Yes, you've got everything that was behind it and the planning stage behind it, but effectively it's been there. How many customers do you have? I don't think we share our specific customer count, but it's can you give, Can you give me kind of like... Is it in the thousands now? Yeah. Order of magnitude is call it, you know, about a thousand, I would say is a, a rough number right now. 
and you see that multiplying and multiplying. It's it's honestly, it's a phenomenal business model, number one. You've done such an incredible job. You've given us some really valuable advice. I, honestly, I've spoken to lots of people that have done great things in business, but this, I would say, hat taken off, sir. Congratulations on your success. Well done. Oh, thank you so much. Like I said, some hard work, a little bit of luck, but really have the the team to thank. I mean, we've we've just surrounded the company with great people and uh, it's been a lot of fun. There comes the modest humble guy out for a second there. Ladies and gentlemen, Austin, Austin Allison, go check out Picasso. You'll find them online. They've got a beautiful website. Okay, go and look at what they do. Understand the business. It's very clear to understand on their website and, and think about this company. You might not think, much like my wife, that shared home ownership makes sense. But when you really think about it, if you own a second property, are you going to use it for a lot of the time? If you're not, then this might be a sensible alternative. As I say, go check out Picasso, follow Austin. You'll see him on all kinds of social media. He's out there on LinkedIn and whatnot. And congratulations to you, sir, for, for a fantastic, successful business. Thank you so much, Spencer. Thank you.